Welcome to Integrate Yourself, everybody. I'm your host, Allison Polo, and you can find me at finallythrivingbook.com and allisonpolo.com. Today, I am here with a very special guest, Jator Pierre. He is a friend of mine. I've known him for years, and he's a world-class integrative health and wellness coach, improving the psychological, physical, and emotional well-being of executives, professionals, athletes, coaches, and facilitators for over 20 years. Welcome to the show, Jator. I am so excited you're here. I'm very, very excited, Allison. <laughs> this is so, me excited. Yeah, it's very, yeah, very um, subtle <laughs> these days, right? <laughs> very subtle. <laughs> so we've also, known, yeah, go ahead. What? I'm, um, I'm coaching ice hockey, uh, 14, 14 year olds and Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we have pretty late night practices. So um, either that will be a good thing for this podcast or a terrible thing. We'll find out shortly. Hey, you know what? This podcast, um, it, it's, you know, anything kind of goes uh, that I've found in, in the mistakes are, are welcome. So, you know, it's actually a gift. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So whatever yeah however it goes this is going to be a good show i know no matter what so um, well you know i don't believe in mistakes but exactly well you know i do believe in showing up tired or showing up hitting all cylinders and i don't know which one's better yet well i guess we'll find out <laughs> come as you are Jator, come right? as you are that's what they tell me <laughs> so they stop calling <laughs> Right. All you could do is channel your best. That's all you can do. <laughs> That's what I do. Some days are better than others. Um, yeah. So, you know, you know, my, I've been going through a lot of changes in my own body lately, you know, kind of going through pre-menopause and my brain is feeling it. So we may have a pretty interesting show today. We'll see. We'll see how it goes, mm -hmm. you know, um, <laughs> between the two of us. So uh, thanks again for being on my show. We've known each other for quite some time. And uh, we started back in the day with the Journeys of Wisdom crowd and uh, met there, I think, originally. And then you are you also used to work for the Czech Institute, just to give people a little bit of background on how we met. Uh, and then, you know, since then, we've been keeping in touch through the years. And I participated in one of your earlier programs, which I loved very much. And now you're on to doing other projects and, and other things that are amazing. So uh, I'd love to talk about that today, as well as um, what you've been up to the past couple of years, how the, how everything we went through uh, as a collective really kind of shaped what you're doing now and, and, and what your perspective is, perspective is on what people are needing right now as well. Uh, which one of those questions should I start with? Allison? Whichever one you'd like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer any of them. You could just start talking about whatever you'd I'm like. I'm going to go in a different direction. <laughs> <laughs> Feel Let's free. See. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, we've jumped on a podcast, I think two or three times up to this point. And we have, yeah. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for that opportunity and I'm always honored to be a guest. And since the last time uh, Denmark continued uh, in terms of my um, growth there, business growth, personal growth, uh, family growth, and really in many ways, stretching into and challenging myself in ways that I didn't think I would do prior to leaving. Uh, so taking on the co-responsibility of a family and a partner and a child and taking on responsibility in terms of coaching 14 U, 16 U, 17 U's in, in Denmark in terms of ice hockey. And you know, each one of those places have taught me different things about myself, but I think mainly 
the biggest lessons have been this would be weird to say the biggest lessons have been I'm I was clear before and I'm still clear what I mean by that is I challenged some of my preconceptions of what I might uh what I might want in my life mm. and after going through those experiences and tasting that fruit rather than thinking about what that fruit might taste like I can clearly say that my original thought was true that fruit is not for me <laughs> and that feels really grounding healthful and clear in my heart and my mind that I, I did it. I tried it. I faced those fears or I faced those stories and allowed myself to stretch into a places that I didn't think I would ever go. That also gives me a lot of fortitude now coming back to the United States and knowing that I can deeply stretch into places that I'm afraid to go and go find out if the fear is true, if the thought that I have about the topic or the experience is actually true. And, and that gives me a lot of motivation and a lot of security and self-power to try new things on with a lot of courage and discovery rather than kind of shying away from aspects of my life or myself that go unexplored that I'm simply afraid or ashamed to try on. Yeah. So what, what is the, what are one of the biggest fears that you were struggling with there uh, during that time and that come up for you now yeah. even? I think, you know, one of the biggest fears and biggest challenges that I noticed uh, being in a, a family dynamic where I was uh, you know, bonus dad and had a wife and a child. I think one of the fears, which in part was also true, mm -hmm. is in that dynamic I found out I was more needy than I thought I was. I found out that, of course, I knew the, the psychology around there'll be some competing and comparing with uh, my bonus child for my partner's attention. I recognized that before stepping in. What I didn't recognize was how needy parts of me actually are for that attention. Mm. And while in that, doing my best to give myself that attention and getting validation, attention, et cetera, from myself, and also working with my partner and my bonus child at the time to try to congeal a more, let's say, healthy family dynamic that requires though from my perspective now in hindsight it requires a full buy-in from your partner from yourself uh, and an agreement that we're doing this from a place of attempting to congeal the family whereas it can be experienced as we're doing it from a place of separating the family, mm. i.e. I'd like more time with my partner and she makes changes in her life to make that available for us. But those changes come from a place, at least maybe in this case, come from a place where it's not really what she wanted to do, but she didn't know how to give full voice to that or to represent that so that 
the underlying resentment about making that choice wasn't blossomed in a sense. And me needing to be more honest and upfront about what my needs are, even to a greater extent. And uh, representing that truth to the best of my ability and to the widest breadth and depth of that, because we both attempted it. We both attempted to be as honest in that as we could. And yet there were still on both sides corners that got cut that I think in some regard led to resentment toward each other, mm. which led to as resentment toward each other leads to pain, shame, fear, emotional separation, disassociation, etc. The responsibility of having a family was also a fear of mine. Mm. There's, well, there's a lot of responsibility in having a family. Yeah. There's the, um, you know, putting others first in a sense, or at least in alignment or horizontal with you in terms of importance. And I noticed there was challenges I had when uh, most weekends were filled with Disney Channel and, uh, you know, little kid shows, which is beautiful. Yeah. I'm not right. saying none of this was beautiful. There was extraordinarily beautiful moments in this process that I found and I would have never have experienced or tasted without stepping into it. And now in hindsight, I have clarity on if I was to do that again, which I doubt I would. Clarity on even more levels of honesty, authenticity, realness, speaking up, Weekly meetings, at least with your partner, where there's an hour of time deeply cut out to really be present with each other and connect on all of this stuff. Um, yeah, so, and then that builds into myself. I need that too. Not from the outside, but also how do I even more so get clear, honest, and authentic with myself and carve out time to really be with myself on a, on a weekly or daily basis. And I don't mean to go do something for myself or to do something I enjoy or play a game or play hockey or watch a movie. Outside of those things, I, I mean... Spending time in self-contemplation and, mm -hmm. and talking to myself, mm -hmm. uh, my, my inner children, my teenagers, my adults, and really spend time getting to know the, the vastness of, of what's inside of me that is still vast and unknown. If some yeah. of that makes a little bit of sense. <laughs> yeah, it does. And, and I didn't mention in the very beginning at least I don't think I did, how, how much of a, um, uh, let's say a master of emotions and relationships that you ha are because you really dive deep into the feelings behind it and you really explore these things. And this is what you help many people with, and you've done this for years. So, um, yeah, beautifully said, uh, and, and I feel like also when you share either through your newsletter or on Instagram, it's always, um, it's always a share from your own personal experience of your own relationships and what you've learned mm -hmm. from those. And I really appreciate that because we're all like doing our best to navigate relationships. Those are the, that's one of the three pillars of the most important things to people, you know, it's money relationships and health. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so yeah, it sounds like you, yeah, you really try to, it, that's a tough one, you know, that's a tough one coming in as a bonus parent, you know, and, and yeah, that's a big challenge and not to mm -hmm. mention you were in another country too. So that was also, um, another thing, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I appreciate something you just said um we're, we're all doing our best and 
in some regard, you know, that that statement has been kind of become cliche and it's really deep. It's a really deep statement for me. And I know that throughout that process of being in Denmark and being in in that relationship or partnership, I was doing my best. And so was she. And so was my bonus daughter. And so was everyone else around us. And often when things go awry, the immediate assumption or the reactive assumption for many of us is, that person wasn't doing their best and we get to then criticize, feel a sense of arrogance and self-righteousness and a sense of power when we're hurt by someone else's, I'll take that back, when we're hurt by our experience of someone else's actions. And that's when things tend to melt and kind of fall apart, whereas even in those spaces of pain and destruction or someone not doing or following through on what was said, et cetera, when there's these challenges in relationships and partnerships. For me, one of the major beauties of that space whether it remains in connection as I were together or whether it goes in separateness, like, you know, illusory separateness, we're not together. There's moments in there when things are in destruction that there's a lot of space to create connection, hmm. context, understanding and a much wider paintbrush of what has occurred why it's occurred what does it mean what's the underlying stories uh what are your emotional experiences of it what are my emotional experiences of it what were our agreements where were these agreements broken there's a lot in those destructive places to learn a tremendous amount about ourselves if, big if, if people are willing to keep that lens center, we're all doing our best. Essentially for me, what that means is compassion. Mm, yeah. Compassion for myself and compassion for other and recognizing in myself that, uh, I'm, I am not perfect, nor are you. And there's going to be discrepancies in values and challenges that come up. And going through those spaces together, whether we do it to reconcile or to consciously acknowledge and then go in separate direction, for me is, is extremely important and powerful and a largely missed opportunity by many people who go through breakups or separation or divorce, et cetera, because of the emotional pain that many of us feel in those spaces and we can't see anything else but that. We're so emotionally charged in that space that we become, as a theme, reactively myopic. We become very, 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 very tight-sided. Um, you know, maybe a metaphor would be this. You and I go to a seven-course meal. The pre-meal is delicious. Number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six, number seven. All, excuse me, six. All are, hmm. And then number seven comes and you and I look at each other and like, this dessert sucks. <laughs> and then we say, this whole meal sucked. Mm. For me, that's untrue. Meal number one through number six was joyous, beautiful, connective, true. And because there's a, a seventh that comes in, 
that doesn't meet your needs or you believe that the chef didn't do his best or her best does not immediately imply that all six other meals went out the door. And yet so many people carry that type of perspective. If I get this one shitty thing, all things associated with person, place, food, chef, et cetera, must mean they were all shitty. <laughs> and so you get to you get to be in that space then when that shittiness is coming up and have a, a, a conscious choice to talk about that and how do we look at that and still respect and honor and have reverence for those six other meals, parts of the meal that we had together because they were important and they were beautiful and they were tender and they were true. But to have this one moment that then makes all of that stream an untruth, people have to be in so much reactive emotional defense to play that story out and then look for evidence around them from other people to build the truth of wait a second those six other meals weren't good either exactly. and that's typically the breakup process where it doesn't need to be like that at least not in my mind it doesn't no i love um, that i yeah. can be a little kooky <laughs> <laughs> no that's a wonderful metaphor i love there. it yeah yeah and we can apply that to anything in our life any situation any relationship because it, it is funny how i i love how you bring that up because uh we always we people tend to focus on the most negative aspect of every situation it seems like right and then when you do that you do forget about all the beauty within it and um, you also categorize categorize things as good and bad when really there's not any such thing. It's just, it just mm -hmm. is, right? So, uh, yeah. So I, I think we could all be happier and more satisfied as human beings if we could look at it like that. Just focus more on the beautiful things that could happen, that have happened or that you're experiencing or you've experienced along the way. And then that will give you compassion because you're also giving yourself compassion within that process, right? Mm -hmm. Like when going back to what you mentioned earlier about spending time with yourself, have you, if you've, and this is what I learned along the way, if, if you've never actually spent enough time with yourself to experience yourself, then it's hard for other people to experience the real you because you haven't experienced you yet. So, you know, it's, uh, that's important too. So there's so many, there's so many nuances within that. And I love that you mm. brought that up. Yeah, and I, I love what you said too. Um, you know, we tend to forget that. And well, I think that's true. Maybe underneath that, maybe, and I, I don't know. It's it's almost not a forgetfulness. It's 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 either a conscious or a subconscious purposefulness of blinding ourselves to that beauty so that we can congeal and really solidify the story of negativity uh, to give us potentially, to give us the power, the perceived power um, to leave the situation or to pretend that it really didn't hurt or that it really didn't matter, or that it wasn't really true. For me, that's all deflective language. And, and my purpose here isn't to say only to focus on the six meals that were delicious. It's to say, when you notice a hyper focus on the seventh meal that wasn't up to what you thought or up to par or there was a hair in your food <laughs> that's a trust issue right there right <laughs> yes <laughs> that you you have we as human beings have the opportunity 
to create balance in the lens that we're seeing through, we get to see our partner or our friend or ourselves through a lens of extreme nuance, almost like a kaleidoscope. You know, when you look in a kaleidoscope, it's this endless loop of pieces and parts. That's how I experience human beings to be. And if you allow yourself to see that in yourself and recognize I have shadow sides, the unknown. I have parts of me that I would deem as, e those are some terrible choices. I have some parts that I would deem as, yes, those parts made good choices. I have childish parts. I have childlike parts. I have mature aspects, et cetera. When you start to really look in your own kaleidoscope and accept more of those aspects of self, then when you're in these other situations, you can see more of yourself in the other person, which helps build your compassion for you first and foremost, and then to lens that compassion toward the other. And that doesn't mean the compassion says, uh, you tricked and duped me and or you broke this agreement we had and that's okay. That's not compassion from my, from my perspective. Compassion says, now I understand more of why that happened and I have a broader contextual understanding of what was going on inside of you. And I still choose to go different ways. Hmm. And that's okay. But to what so many people do is end in conflict and 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 pain almost to um, force that separation away from each other where you can have that separation with connection which is a very strange sentence <laughs> but you can still have connection in separation through understanding hearing acknowledgement compassion, and uh, really allowing yourself to see yourself in the other person. And then also having your healthy limits and boundaries in place. I'm really harping on this because I think it's such a missed, beautiful opportunity. And I'll use you and I as an example. If something happened between you or I, um that was challenging there's no one in my life currently that i wouldn't at least give the time and space for a conversation to understand what had occurred between us and then make a co-creative conscious decision with you around how we'll move forward and that might be we move forward or it might be we move forward and we're going to rebuild trust with each other. Or it might be we're going to move forward and get a coach or do therapy. Um, but there's so many more beautiful ways to, to end something. And I think in hindsight, big uh, 2020 hindsight now, in partnership and or in business relationships and or in fr friendship, basically with anyone that I can actually have a conversation with. Who's <laughs> <laughs> kind of, you know, in my, in my life is asking the question beforehand, when and if this goes awry, how do you want to end this? Mm. Like setting it up as almost a a, a, a spoken contract beforehand, because shit's going to hit the fan. <laughs> Something's going to hit. Yeah. And if you have a, a platform in the past to apply to the present of remember the conversation we had about when this comes up. Now we can apply those principles to what's going on and, and figure our way through this rather than what most of us would do is the reactive, 
reactive disillusionment of partnership, relationship, business, et cetera, that we experienced watching our parents do it. And those were our models. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. Sometimes not great models for that. And <laughs> I'm hearing you I'd say, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. And I, th I think from my experience too, it's, it is, you're, you're going through different phases in relationships too. So there's always going to be challenges or things to, or I would say not even challenges, but I mean, conflict, you know, I think, mm -hmm. I think the best word to describe it is conflict because many of us are afraid to, I know I was one of those people. I was afraid to really uh, lean into conflict because uh, it just didn't feel good for me. I, I didn't really understand how to deal with it when I was a child and when I'd watch my parents deal with conflict. And uh, so it wasn't modeled great for me either. And so as an adult, I just avoided it uh, and tried to, you know, and within the relationship, tried to uh, make everything really good and hope make everybody happy. And, you know, mm. and you know that how that goes. So, uh, later I, you know, I've learned how to make peace with conflict and actually that it's a good thing because then we're, we're growing together. We're, we're discovering more about each other. We're learning how to communicate better. You know, um, it's a way to express our emotions with each other that maybe we haven't been sharing. So, um, conflict in a way is, I think is a, a good growth opportunity for the relationship. Um, and so, and there's going to be many stages of that through all relationships. And, and like you said, it's, there's some relationships you try to end on a good note with compassion for each person, but so, sometimes that person doesn't want to play that game. So, you know, then you have to do what you got to do and set your boundaries. Right. Um, but yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, wisdom in that. And, you know, I've never thought about it like that, Jator, honestly, about speaking about it beforehand, how are we going to handle this? If this happens, you know, mm. and it's very <laughs> interesting. Yeah. I think too, what you shared about conflict, I, I really, uh, appreciate, um, we're, uh, often afraid of conflict for a, a plethora of reasons. And I think in a very paradoxical way, what I've been sharing about this experience is that conflict can actually be extremely intimate. It might be one of the most intimate places we can go with another human being. It's so uncomfortable for most of us, it's so awkward. It's shaming. It can feel shaming. It can fear. It can feel fearful. And it's one of the reasons why so much of so many of us omit truth or hide is because of our fear or shame about what conflict actually means, at least in 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 this perspective which is a very big light side to conflict, which is deep intimacy. You have to be really honest to be in conflict. Mm. You have to be really present to be in conflict. As an example, if you're talking to someone that's on their cell phone while you're talking and there's something that's conflict that comes up, they won't even notice because they're distracted. They actually have to be present with you to hear what you're saying, to feel the conflict, to engage in it. And because so many of us are afraid of what conflict represents to us, that then implies a tremendous amount of intimacy. Because if you look at you know, a picture of a dog flipping over on its back to expose its stomach, that's essentially what con what, what intimacy feels for a lot of us. It's it's showing our underbelly. It's showing what we don't want to show. It's going in places that we don't want to go. Uh, there can be a sense of weakness associated with it. And yet there's a tremendous amount of strength and courage and discovery that comes from laying on your back and exposing your belly 
even in a place that feels tense and and scary and so if you look at a partnership or relationship that is conflict free i would say you are looking at probably the most unhealthy relationship or partnership i can imagine <laughs> that was my parents <laughs> Right. It from my perspective, <laughs> it means people are lying, omitting, hiding, and swallowing most, if not all, of their truths and experiences. We all are raised in different families and come with different value sets, some that we're attached to and some that we're not. And often many of us are loyal to who we think we should be based on those values. Getting two people to live together or to be in partnership together in that sense Im immediately says, well, there's there's going to be conflict here. We were raised in different houses. We right. see things differently. Uh, you put the toilet paper roll that it goes uh, to the back. I put the toilet, toilet paper roll that it goes to the front. I think I'm right. You think you're right. But if we're not saying anything to each other, then we're just swallowing our truth. And that builds a lot of hidden resentment and more shame and more fear. And then we end up with two people living together that are actually not even living together. They're surviving together. And a lot of people would see a relationship that is conflict free and say, that's what I want. And I'd say, no, that's not what you want. You want to learn how to become friends with conflict within your relationship so that your healthy limits and boundaries are represented and you work with your partner to understand each other uh, and find compromise, understanding, compassion, and work towards something intimately inclusive of conflict. Are you seeing people avoid conflict more these days or do you feel like people are actually making mm -hmm. friends with conflict <laughs> what are you seeing yeah. you live in san francisco right <laughs> <laughs> you had to bust me out didn't you <laughs> it's funny i have a lot to say about that um okay so uh, my experience here in california conflict avoidant uh, politically correct, um, unnuanced, uh, a hide your truth uh, because the the ocean of backlash here that one might receive for having a perspective that is different than the narrative here in California is as violent and astronomical as those who are on the other side of this hmm. say shouldn't occur. Hmm. And so here in California, I can say that it feels conflict avoidant. It feels, it feels uh, my experience is unnuanced. And there's very little room for conversation or challenge. And this goes back to conflict. There's such a deep, my experience is there's such a deep rooted stream of consciousness right now that says conflict is bad. Disagreement is bad. Mm -hmm. Having different perspectives is bad. And if you have those differing perspectives or um, you see the world differently, it doesn't mean just that you have a different opinion. It means that you're a terrible person. It means yeah. that you don't care about people, that you don't care about yourself, you don't care about your family. And quite frankly, and this is not one side or the other or one person or the other. Of course, this happens with, with all of us in some regard. 
right now my experience with with many people around what's going on on the planet currently it feels insane mm. it's dangerous to speak your truth which is the killer of truth like we we have to be able to uh, challenge each other we have to be able to have differing opinions and those that don't believe that really interesting to me i think that at a subconscious level they don't recognize maybe how powerful the truth actually is mm. you don't need to protect the truth the truth protects itself and any story against that truth will eventually fall to the wayside it'll eventually dissolve and to not even allow whatever the current truth to be challenged implies that it's a weak story as an example um <laughs> oh tour conspiracy theories <laughs> yay we're going to talk about <laughs> conspiracy theories <laughs> this is a great topic because yes i mean it's the elephant in the room right all it's the, the things elephant we're talking in the room. about yeah it's conspiracy theories right um <clears throat> for you to create stories that um if you put conspiracy theory out is then called misinformation and you will get in trouble your bank account blocked you'll get shut down you'll get deplatformed whatever it is actually paves way for conspiracy conspiracy to happen yeah they're creating it right yeah it actually creates a deep hidden place for it to actually occur without being checked because there's no checks and balance anymore. Right. <laughs> and and that is insanity. That's insanity. Yeah. Regardless of what we're talking about, it, these differing perspectives need to be had because it's like chiseling so that we can find out what is the actual truth of what's going on without allowing the chisel we are creating a space where that all of those stories can go completely unchecked unvetted and unlooked at that is the conspiracy in and of itself <laughs> yeah it's so interesting i i it's obvious what's happening but yet they keep doing it and i think to myself well what are they what are your thoughts on that what are they what are they hiding what are they trying to hide why 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 is there so much censorship uh going on right now with all of this it's, and mean, it's random censorship too because i know some people that are talking about the certain things and they're not getting censored but other people are it's just an interesting like thing that's happening yeah you know i have guesses i don't have any real uh, i've heard a lot of things of course and some of them i'm like wow that's if that's true and then others i'm like okay well maybe um uh, there seems to be uh, some kind of a, a power and control grab. I don't know who that is or why that is. Other than if I boil that down to individuals, that's probably the best place I can look. You know, when I look at myself, when am I trying to look for control or power or self-righteousness? Um is because I, I'm I'm in my narcissistic part. It's for me and for no one else. Power for me. And 
you know, if, if I put myself sometimes in the, I'm assuming these are people that are making these decisions. <laughs> I don't know if it's AI. Yeah, we don't lizard. really know, do we? I mean, you know, at this point, anything is possible, man. Yeah, uh, I've seen some stuff. I don't know. I don't know if I'll talk about it on this My platform, assumption but... is it's humans. <laughs> I'll stick with that. Yeah. And, um, you know, you put yourself, let's just say you, you work for a pharmaceutical company that is, uh, in the business of making money, right. They're not in the business of health. Like, I, I don't understand the concept that, that the pharmaceuticals in the business of health, like they have shareholders, <laughs> stocks, like they're into making money. So what we yeah. can just start just with that piece. That yes. doesn't mean they're bad. It doesn't mean they're good. I'm just saying. That's what they're doing. Yeah. That's what that's, doing. Everybody's always known money. that. I thought, like, I thought we knew <laughs> that already. <laughs> so, you know, if I put myself in, in those shoes, working at a company like that, and there's an interesting human phenomenon that uh, happens over time, which is your experience becomes relative. So what I mean by that is, I I live in a flat right now, but I really want to get that house across the street. It's for sale. I really want that house. It's a beautiful house. I've been inside of it. I love every room. The countertops are, mm. I love the kitchen. And I buy the house. I'm in the house. A couple months pass. I look across the street. There's another house. I don't really pay that much attention to my house anymore. So there, there's like this washing out effect that happens. And so, you know, my perspective would be it, if these games are being played by people in closed rooms at very high levels, they've had exposure to a tremendous amount of uh, paper death, let's say, numbers on a paper how many people get affected by these things and it's numbers on a paper numbers on a piece of paper or on a computer screen over time is very easy to wash out that those are actual human beings paying the cost of your decisions mm -hmm. it's like you're not you're not on the ground watching it right if you created a pharmaceutical drug that the side effects you know I, I don't remember that i don't know the specific numbers off the top of my head in terms of what's appropriate or not in terms of what might happen when you take something there are numbers that are appropriate and numbers that are not appropriate apparently it's a very low number they're supposed <laughs> to be very low um we surpassed that but those very low yeah. numbers are also astronomical numbers when you apply it to billions of people. Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. And so and and yet it still ends up being something that becomes your 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 relative reality. You start to lose track that those are actual people. It's like the military using drones uh to to drop bombs and to attack people that's very different than being in a tank on the ground shooting people it's a completely different experience and it's so disassociative you're so far removed from it that the decision becomes easier to make i'm not saying i agree with it i'm just saying i understand how this happens to people because most people are not eating well. Most people are not sleeping well. Most people are self-hypnotized. Most people are not questioning their themselves. And if we have that happening at the highest levels, back down to the individual, my guess would be how these individuals run countries is very similar to how they run their own households and is very similar how to how they run themselves internally. My point is, <laughs> excuse my english no fucking wonder we're in this shit show yeah <laughs> and yes. we need grassroots help like we need i don't know much about this but 
if I apply it to my work today, why is my work with 14 year olds, 13 year olds and 12 year olds so heart fulfilling for me and purposeful for me? Because I know I have a better chance of changing the future with them than I do with adults. And yeah. I know that I get the opportunity with them to plant seeds of all of what we've talked about in the realm of hockey, which is an easy place to expand into all of these other things. That I have an, a real opportunity to create change with a, a, the next generation. Not to say I'm giving up on ours. I will still fight that fight. As you know very well, as we age, we become more congealed as a theme to our stories, more rigid, more blind to self, more self-hypnotized as a general theme. They're much harder eggs to crack. Mm -hmm. And at the same, same way, if I look at that and apply that to populations, uh, those people at the top are congealed and and safe and fed for generations to come. Why would you want to give that up? That's true. Yeah. It's a rare bird in that place that's going to say, you know what? I think we should share this with everyone. Good point. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying it's right or wrong. Yeah, I often just want to put myself in the shoes of of what might be going on because then it helps me. Okay, well, I get that, and then I can work <laughs> with that. Yeah, if I just create stories of malice and terrible people and they're evil and all of this, then that goes back to where we started again. Yeah, we get to address conflict differently, but we have to model the behavior that we want to experience. If we don't do that and we judge, criticize, and attack those people in the same way we feel judged, criticized, and attacked, it's just more of the same. Yes. Yeah. And I love how you went full circle back to conflict and intimacy because it, it you know, as you were saying earlier there is a lack of intimacy because again even at the even with people on social media you're, you're not face to face with someone saying these things to them if you're you know giving them mm -hmm. criticism and you probably wouldn't do that face to face to somebody right but it's so totally acceptable <laughs> to do it like on a some kind of a social media platform and uh, people do it all the time. And we've gotten used to that. And same thing with, uh, you know, the numbers on the screen, like you're saying with the pharmaceutical mm -hmm. companies and all that. So it's like, there is that lack of face-to-face uh, -face intimacy, both with ourselves and with other people that really create that division or separation within us. It really is a separation within ourselves, right? So Well said. Yeah. Well said. I notice it with the, the kids that I work with. They're, um, they spend so much time on their phones and social media where a lot, if not all of the behavior there as a theme is pretty reactive. I mean, that's just reaction. And even the, the posts or what people say as a general theme, I'm assuming is probably pretty reactive. Um. These kids in person, the way that they connect with their teammates, which is something we're deeply working on right now, is through criticism. Mm -hmm. When I was on teams, when I was a kid, now I feel like I'm an old man. When I was a kid, um, <laughs> my teams, of course, we had challenges. And of course, people made mistakes on the ice or a bad play. But we were supportive of that person and we knew that was going to happen. Like that sport, like there's going to be, it's, it's so in the moment and so malleable and so quick that people are going to make mistakes that aren't the exact one to stop a goal from happening. Like that's the nature of sport. But the way they interact with each other in that context 
is like they're talking to each other on their phone. Wow. And the dialogue actually is becoming, in my opinion, shorter and shorter and less nuanced, deep, thoughtful time. Um, it's, it's, it's really strange to watch. And, and of course, there, there's definitely a part of me that says, am I just old? <laughs> or is this really effed up? I or think both. it's a little bit of both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm I'm saying that to myself too because yeah. I think that as well. You know, uh, with especially, I always like uh, reflect on that for myself when I'm talking. You know, I have two adult sons, young adult sons, and I have to kind of you know, double check and be like, huh, am mm. I just saying this because of my generation or what I'm used to, or is it something that I need to open myself up to, or is this really, you know, uh, a problem, you know, or an issue for this, and, and for this that's next generation. Beauty. I'm going to cut you off like a jerk. That's yeah, the go ahead. beauty <laughs> that you just said, like what you just said is the self-reflective process that I would assume a lot of people go through, but at different levels of depth, there's, man, there's so much beauty there. If you let that, if, if we, as, as I know you do, you're my friend, as, as we let that open up, there's so much exploration in there. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, that is the compassion for the situation. Cause then you're not just categorizing it or judging it and putting it in a file and closing the drawer, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's Hell an yeah. old, uh, that's an indication that I'm old there too, because of the file uh, metaphor, <laughs> but um, that's, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> but anyway, putting it in your file on your computer and closing. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, but yeah, um, I, yeah, I think that um, this is, this is a great point to bring up for, for this. Cause yeah, I mean, like you said, there's a lot of things that, maybe they are supposed to experience because they are going into a completely different world. Right. And at the same time, like there is some wisdom for the generation before to pass on to that, that uh, younger generation um, of, you know, the nuance in life, the connection that, you know, the personal connections I think are important, especially after the past couple of years we just went through. Um mm. And I'm seeing a lot of consequences uh, to that as well. And and I would can uh, I before we close up, Jator, I would just love to hear your your uh, take on or your views on what the consequences could be for you know really uh, deflecting conflict in our life. And if we have a whole generation that's doing this or not reflecting or reacting mostly, you know, if we're going to continue to see this pattern crop up, um, what do you think is, are the consequences and what is maybe the solution to that? Hmm. That's a small question to end with. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Uh, well, consequences of that, um, my guess would be a, a lot of pain for a lot of people. Um, I'll, I'll take that one step further. A lot of death for a lot of people. Um, uh, pain, death, destruction, and, and a vast amount of, of change to how we live together and how we experience ourselves and each other. And in my book, there's a part of me that says that's a, a, a bad thing. There's another part of me that says that's a good thing. And my experience uh, of myself personally there is there's there is destruction almost as a requirement for new life to be born or to be birthed and out of these very challenging times um, that i would say some of us are in right i'm in a 
I'd say I'm in a somewhat challenging time, but relatively speaking, very little challenge. Like there's people on the planet that are way more challenged. Um, that destruction and challenge has to give birth to something new. Now, I don't know what that new is. I do know that there's parts of me that would probably judge that new as not what I want to participate in. <laughs> That's also because I'm, I'm, I'm programmed uh, in the sense of I'm 45. So my value set that I'm still pretty attached to says, I don't want to go down that path. Um, and yet, be inevitable like when when you and i are on a like a podcast right now and whoever listens to this and there's lots of cool podcasts like yours with lots of cool people that is literally a drop in the ocean of everyone else we're talking in a opposition to literally and i think we often well i'll speak for myself i often forget that it's not we are the small numbers. That doesn't mean we're powerless from my perspective. It does mean we have a lot of work to do to turn this tide. And when the tide is being turned into censorship of brilliant, nuanced, thoughtful, scientists and doctors and MDs uh, who are well vetted and really intellectually uh, brilliant at what they do, male and female. And that is being taken away. That, that wave of ocean becomes one that I don't know I can surf personally. Um, as an example of a podcast I really enjoy, Dark Dark Horse podcast. Mm, yeah. Um, I experience those two and who they have on as guests to be some of the most intellectually on point people I've ever heard talk. Yes, for sure. And they are silenced and yeah. demonetized and deplatformed. That to me means something is really a miss <clears throat> yeah you can definitely tell their hesitancy uh really speaking their full truth you know a mm -hmm. lot of times it's mm -hmm. they hold back quite a bit you yeah because they and they dance around it when when as we could just talk about it you know <laughs> <laughs> without being censored but you know well uh, that, that, that builds into this other piece of like what's downstream consequence is what's downstream consequence to a human being not speaking their truth in any relationship we all know the consequences of that now i just throw that onto a global scale and i say good luck to us all <laughs> that's what i think about too like oh my god Wait, man i hate yeah. to be a debbie downer but we are yeah. in a... <laughs> wow it's true. We're in a special place right now. Yes. <laughs> yes. Most challenging and most interesting times for sure. Well, yeah. Oh my God. Thank you. And so what, yeah. what I, what, what, as individuals, what we can do from Okay. Yeah. Let's is, come up with a solution here while we're on the show today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll sprinkle maybe some, some, some shot at a solution. <clears throat> maybe it sounds cliche, but it does start with us. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It also it also then really bleeds into that perspective of what we originally started this conversation about when conflict occurs as we're in you get a choice. Are you going to shame and blame and attack or are you going to come at this in a new way? Are you going to come with compassion <clears throat> excuse me uh, asking questions like 
what part of myself am I seeing in this global behavior? What part of me acts out the same behavior in my everyday life and I don't see it? I know that may not sound like much, but from my perspective, if it's true that we are a collective consciousness, then every one of those thoughts in that way is pouring something different into that pool. I don't think that's any small feat. I think it's very challenging to do that though. It's very challenging to be in deep challenge and to stay present, to stay aware, to look for how you're going to respond, to look at wanting to understand another, to look at wanting to understand yourself and using a model of compassionate communication or nonviolent communication in the sense of I'm deeply looking to understand, not condemn, criticize, or attack. That bridge, very few people in my, in my experience can cross it. But we can't cross it unless some of us start to try with ourselves and with our family and with our friends and with our partners. And then maybe that grows bigger than that. That's the courage that we all need. That's go the there. Yeah. That's the urge. Well, wow. This was a powerful conversation. We covered a lot in this conversation. <laughs> I enjoyed it so much. Thanks to Tor. Yeah, me too. Thank you for being my friend, being my sister, being my teacher, being an inspiration. Oh, thank you. And yeah, being in my life. Same here. Thank you so much. And I would love for you, before we close up, I want you to tell my audience. Don't forget to tell them how to find you. <laughs> well, I, I also have a free gift. I hope I get this this right. <laughs> a uh, free gift? What? A free gift. I did a masterclass on instinct or intuition. <laughs> oh, okay. A, you. It was your masterclass. Okay. Yeah. You offered it. Okay. <laughs> and it's a, a, a pretty significant PDF and video and audio. I believe the... Website is www.explorewithjator.com forward slash intuition. Cool. Yeah. And my website is www.jatorpierre.com. Uh, I'll be dropping a new paid masterclass, which I'll be involved in teaching in the next few months called open hearted. And that will be about a lot of what we talked about today, communication with self with other language of emotion, uh, language of compassion and understanding self and other. I'm super excited about that. That sounds amazing. I hope so. I think it's good. And um, yeah, my Instagram, Jator Pierre. Uh, which is growing, which I'm really excited about because it really means I matter the more people I have following me. <laughs> Isn't that a weird word to put on there? Like followers. It's so yeah. Weird. Like I don't want followers. Yeah. I just want homies. Yeah. <laughs> or explorers. It is weird. Or fellow explorers. Or into your work. <laughs> but followers is so, I mean, it speaks so much to what people are looking for as a general. Yes. Person. Totally. Someone to follow. Yeah. Influencer. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. so, it's a whole other so much about that. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, uh, about like, anyway, I'll just say this real quick, but the discernment between your, um, the influence you already have within and like mm -hmm. placing your, your, uh, I guess, idolizing a person instead of honoring mm. their ideals through your own mm. expression right and so mm. there's a difference mm, but i, I feel like that. with thank you i feel like with social media we just so much we we idolize people and then that puts them also in a weird position so mm -hmm. you know like don't do that to people <laughs> so it's why i try to be as as honest as i can on social media like i got my challenges and yeah and that's what i wanted human. to start this off with is 
Uh, I learned a lot about myself in Denmark and there's lots of decisions that if I could do again, I would do differently next time. Well, that's what life's all about. You learn and then you do it differently. You get a, a second chance mm -hmm. most, most times, right? <laughs> we hope. <laughs> I mean, in a different way, who knows? I mean, yeah. it depends on the situation, but yeah. anyway, uh, well, thanks so much to tour. That was an incredible conversation. It was great to catch up with and, and connect with you again uh, after yeah. all this time. Yeah. Too. Glad to hear you're thriving. You too. Thank you. Thank you.